Yes, sir. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. On behalf of the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, it gives me a great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to the distinguished chair, fellow scholars, and participants who have joined us through Zoom and are watching this live on YouTube. We are thrilled to have you join us today at International Young Scholars Summit 2020. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young scholars from all over the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and related support. The conference will be held for three days consecutively for 30 different sessions with two parallel sessions, white and green rooms, running simultaneously throughout the conference. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentation and sharing their understanding with us. The session is streaming live on our YouTube, so please feel free to share it on your social media handle with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is the 29th session of the conference and to chair and moderate this session, it's an honor to have Dr. Oymanthi Barua here with us today. Dr. Oymanthi Barua works as research associate and editor at NICE. She works, focuses on issues related to Bangladesh and South Asia. She was awarded prestigious ICSSR fellowship. Dr. Barua holds a PhD from Central for South Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She has published several articles and participated at national and international conferences. Without any further ado, let me now request Dr. Oymanthi Barua to moderate the session. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my thanks to uh, the director of Nepal Institute of uh, International Cooperation and Engagement, uh, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal, for giving this opportunity to chair uh, this session, which is the 29th session of the third day of uh, the International Youth Summit 2020. Uh, it's a great initiative to encourage and bring together such brilliant scholars and researchers from uh, so many countries and giving this platform to everyone to present their ideas, their arguments and uh, research uh, given the current context of international relations, uh, which is very relevant right now. So all these discussions that we are going to hold today are very important and uh, timely. So uh, I think we have uh, seven discussions uh, today. Uh, one, uh, one discussant is uh, not present. And uh, each of you will be given uh, eight minutes. Um, try not to exceed that time. Um, and uh, because we'll be having uh, enough time for uh, question and answers and uh, internal discussions. So uh, we will elaborate uh, on that. And uh, our, our participants are going to touch upon a wide area of uh, aspects, uh, including China, uh, Nepal, India, United Nations, social media. So I'm very excited uh, to listen to all of you and generate some good discussions later on. So uh, without waiting any further, I think I'll start the session. Uh, and our first speaker is uh, Nabin Bhattarai. He's a student uh, of the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy from Tribhuvan University, Nepal and he will be presenting on restructuring and reformation of UN. Uh, Nabin, if you're ready, you can start your presentation now. Is Nabin here? Hello, is my voice audible? Uh, yes, Nabin, we can hear you, you're audible. Uh, okay, uh, good evening everyone. I'm Nobin Bhattrai, a third semester student from DIRD. And uh, in the, first of all, I'm very grateful to NICE for this platform to speak on International Young uh, Scholarship Summit. And uh, in this very session, I'm going to speak on restructuring and reformation of UN. In fact, this is a very broad topic, but uh, due to the, uh, I have to uh, keep everything within 80 minutes. That's why I'm going to give the precise gains of the issue. Now, let me begin. Uh, to, uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, theoretical background uh, 
and issues at hand. Similarly, popular modality of restructuring, and at last there comes the conclusion. So to begin with, uh, let me start with a provocative question. Is UN a liberal project or is it a realist project? You know, realism does not say much about international organizations, and it is a liberalism, it is interdependence, it is a social constructivism that tells about the evolution of these international organizations. And uh, if you look at the United Nations Charter also, it talks about uh, sovereign equality, it talks about uh, universal human rights, it talks about uh, benefits for all. That's why from outside we can see that uh, UN is obviously a liberal project. But uh, is it a liberal project from inside or in reality? Because even inside the UN we have seen the power struggle between the different actors. And there are so many actors and factors. For example, you know, this picture speaks itself. There are so many stakeholders, actors and factors. They are playing the game of power politics. It's just like, you know, there are different concerns, different demands. For example, PUP5, they are a major issue about uh, bitter rights. Similarly, third world countries, they want to fear world order. And if you talk about, if you talk about uh, rising economies, then they need permanent seats in security councils. And even the UN bureaucracy, because they say that because of this uh, globalization, their work pressure has been increased. That's why they need a better facilities while reforming and restructuring uh, United Nations. That's why because of these all factors, and if there's a power struggle between them, that's why from inside, we can say that uh, UN is not only liberal project, it is a realist project also. And uh, uh, so what are the issues at hand? Uh, let's say why we are talking about a restructuring and reformation of UN then, obviously UNGA no binding obligations, UNCA is supposed to be the world parliament, but it can only, only make recommendations. And Security Council is not uh, much accountable to UNCA. That's why it is not democratic practice. UNSC also not truly representative, not democratic. It is just oligarchic, or let's say the uh, just like the uh, petroleum is opaque. And uh, if you talk about uh, UN, uh, let's say you, uh, UNC uh, Social and Economic Council also, uh, there is, uh, there is a, we can raise the question of its functioning and its uh, effectiveness. Uh, similarly, Trusteeship Council is out of use. And if we talk about Secretariat, then the problem has been increased. There are problems without passports or transnational problems like uh, global terrorism, climate change. So there is much demand from UN, but a Secretariat is not uh, able to respond to effectively for all those challenges. That's why uh, reformation and restructuring of UN is a very uh, pressing debate of contemporary world politics. So to be precisely, when we talk about restructuring and uh, let's say the, uh, reforming, then what issue, what issue comes into our mind is obviously it comes to membership, membership especially in the Security Council, it, uh, it comes to the issue of representation, there comes the issue of transparency, and similarly the veto power. So these are because of these factors, you know, UN should be because the world has gone through a period of considerable change since 1945, and uh, we are in a multipolar world. That's why the UN cannot function well to manage the concept of global governance at present time. That's why it must be reformed and restructured. So with this well-positioned background now, let me talk about what are the possible, uh, possible uh, modality for restructuring. And uh, you know, as for the literature review, I found that two popular model, model A and model B. And what model A says, especially about the uh, expansion of a security council membership is there should be six additional permanent seats and no veto power. Because you know, we in historically we have made mistake because when there comes the issue of veto, then we cannot say it is a liberal project because uh, veto power always uh, it's a national interests are overrides because of the veto power in front of a collective interest. So Veto power is uh, something, you know, UN historically we have made a mistake and uh, UN is not functioning well because you, we, we suppose that UN should be the referee of the world politics and the states are the players. And the referee should know where to show the red card, where to show, show the uh, yellow card. But because of this uh, um, provision of the veto power, player have been much more powerful than the referee. That is why UNO is not functioning well. In fact, it is the P5 countries which has made, which has created for the failure of UNO. The end, uh, here, no, model A says no veto power provision, but uh, you know, in, uh, uh, even uh, in this provision, uh, G4, especially India, uh, Brazil, Japan, and Germany, and even including African Union, they regard that veto power is their minimum bargaining point because they are rising economies. While they are not different from that of the present uh, P5 countries of UN. That's why they want to have the similar privilege from UN. That's why, and if we do so, then obviously we make the uh, UN as a realist project because when there comes the issue of 
veto, then um, it, it complicates the scenario situations and UN cannot function well. That's why if we do so, then obviously UN becomes the realist project. And similarly, there comes another uh, model that is Model B, which says that uh, no permanent seats, but uh, the uh, new type of membership can be uh, expanded like four year renewable term seats and one two year non permanent seat uh, on the regional basis. Okay, this sounds uh, true, but uh, it's still uh, uh, introducing a new category of membership also creates the layer of confusion. That is why there is one uh, uniting for consensus. It argues that for a few, uh, 20 non permanent st st uh, seats for, of equal status, because we have already made a mistake by giving granting the veto to the uh, permanent five, the big five. But now, if we again introduce, uh, let's say, another kind of uh, uh, membership also, it will, it will be confusing for us. That's why, why not to add the 20 non permanent uh, seats uh, of equal status so that it can, uh, we can, uh, let's say, uh, it, it will be much participative also. Many countries, they can pan, uh, participate. Okay, tenure can be flexible. We can make it two years, four years, uh, six years, no problem. And uh, there can be rotations. So it, will, it is much inclusive. That's why it is the best way because the main purpose of UNO is uh, to promote democracy, to promote transparency. And in fact, world politics is uh, moving towards the line of greater democratization, but the uh, UN is reversing because if we add the members uh, uh, with a veto like uh, suggested in the Model A, Model A that uh, uh, the claim made by the GFO and uh, GFO and uh, African Union, then obviously it will uh, complicate the situation. All community has only two options in front of them. That is either restructure or reform UN and tackle the present problems or let it be as in the same position and also make it the center of power struggle. That's why this model B is, uh, it is from the liberal perspectives and if we do so then obviously, I'm, I'm sorry, it should be, uh, it should be liberal project. Uh, uh, UN should be, UN becomes a liberal project and it can uh, maintain the concept of global governance well, it can function well, or, and at that time only it becomes the referee. UN should not be only, uh, which, there is a new type of system being created uh, outside the state system because, you know, different uh, non-state actor has, uh, uh, has come into existence uh, because of that, you know, a new system is a new international system is being created. And in that time, only intergovernment, uh, intergovernmentalism doesn't work. That's why UN should be developed the supranationalism so that it can, it, it can be the umbrella term for all the actors that operate in the world politics and we can create, we can make a better, uh, we can create a better, um, uh, we can maintain a global governance in a better way. This is the best situation. And so my conclusion is that restructuring and referring depends on whether we want a realist UN or liberal UN. Okay, it depends on, because if we want a realist UN, then the model is uh, appropriate for that. Or if, you want, if we want a liberal UN, then model B with, uh, let's say that with a membership with equal status should be given because uh, uh, UN is already bad situation and we cannot make it worse by adding other permanent members with a better power. And uh, it is model B is truly representative also because uh, if you look at the, this uh, table shows, uh, if you look at the uh, present form, then permanent five members, temporary 10, and uh, the ratio is one is to two. Uh, but uh, if we go through the realist project as suggested in the model A with better power, then uh, there will be permanent member 11 and temporary 14. and uh, it becomes almost one is to one means it is a uh, let's say less uh, participatory because uh, one uh, 11 countries they get a uh, better power and uh, other rest of the countries out of let's say 180 countries should fight for only 14 seats. That is not inclusive at all. That is not democratic practice at all. And if you go through the liberal project, you have to wrap up. okay, uh, I'm going, I'm going to wrap up five members then. Uh, there should be, let's say, five permanent, uh, 20 uh, temporary, and it is doing one is to four. That's why it is better participatory. This is the best way to reform and restructure UN. Okay, that's all I have to say, and these are all my reference. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Nabin. Uh, that was a very um, insightful presentation that you gave because you have brought out quite a few uh, salient points of the UN and why we need to think about restructuring and reforming uh, the UN. Uh, we will uh, discuss a bit more towards the end of the session, but for now, our second speaker would be uh, Binod Khanda Timilisana. He is a PhD candidate at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy at Tribhuvan University, and he would be presenting on Nepal, uh, on identification of Nepalese of soft power. Uh, if you're ready, Vinod, you may start.
May I start now? Yes, please. You are. You can start now. It's my turn now. Okay. Uh, respected chair. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present in front of the various scholars from uh, around the world. Uh, in my uh, topic is especially identification of Nepal's soft power. Uh, I'm going to presenting upon it and uh, I'm intending to do my PhD research in this same topic as well. And the outline will be this uh, in my presentation. Uh, basically the concept of soft power, how did it evolve? The, there are various forms of powers from military, economic might, political power, technological capacity, so forth. So many powers are there, but the soft power exists in a separate manner in the universe of this power in the world. Uh, when in 1990, 1990, Professor Joseph Nye has coined the term Joseph uh, sorry, soft power. And it is, uh, at present, it is an uh, iconic code among political scientists, political leaders, policy makers, scholars, academia, researchers, and so forth. And the soft power is in essence the ability to influence the preference and behavior of various sectors in the arena through attraction or persuasion rather than coercion. That is the distinct thing about soft power. We should be aware about it. The attraction upon the country from the persuasion and uh, attraction rather than the coercion. And uh, the, another scholar has uh, defined this uh, soft power is hard power threatens, soft power seduces, and where is hard power deciduous and soft power perseduous. That sort of definition is given about soft power. Similarly, hard power is push, which always push the actors from the cooperation and the soft power is a pull, attracts towards the actor and what he wants, what she wants. And similarly, is uh, Joseph Nye has coined, had coined at that time, the soft power of a country is primarily in the three things. They are culture, political values, and foreign policies. These are the things we should remember about uh, soft power. This is the concept of basically emerged. And about hard power, in long term, it is sensation, uh, sensation trade, conditionality, military power posturing, coercive diplomacy, refusal of cooperation, that sort of thing appears. And in short term sense, and boycott, military invasion, cut off of energy supply, and so things are there. Very soft power. Why soft power is uh, especially attracted to Netflix also? Because of our geopolitical location also, we can mention here in my next slide, I'll limit it. I, I'll just mention it. And soft power is the first legitimate domestic institution, transparency, strong military intervention, and uh, capabilities, public diplomacy, aid, sharing, that sort of thing that come, comes under soft power. That is the concept. That's why what sort of such soft power are there within the Nepal that is very emerging to uh, study. It is very burning issues for Nepalese context, in my opinion, in my observation. Similarly, uh, how, why I, uh, we identified this, uh, never, uh, it is necessary to identifying the Nepal soft power because of, uh, as I already mentioned that, when a particular stakeholder or state examines its or uh, strengths and weaknesses in uh, soft power, then exactly uh, she can measure her capabilities and potentialities in the international arena. Similarly, ideas of the soft power is governments and stakeholders to set priorities to improve global reputation of country. How can, for example, for Nepal also, how can Nepal enhance success, success will be success to uh, build up its reputation all over the world or the in, in international arena for this nepal need to examine its soft power in the research paradigm in structure format that's why you have to do something in soft power similarly as i already mentioned for nepalese we are in, in such a situation that how can we pursue others how can we attract the international community towards nepal how can we pull other communities towards nepal for this context it is very essential and mandatory to study to identify the Nepal's soft power. Though it is a vague concept, there are so many dimensions, so many, so many wings, so many branches of soft powers. That's why it's very difficult to identify. Though we have to do some attempt to identify it. That's why it's my attempt upon it. And soft power strategy might, uh, that is also the reason, might be of for sovereign independent, prosperous Nepal rather than hard power in maintaining diplomatic ties. 
in the countries Nepal. That's what Nepal need to do. And other countries that being a two giant countries in the north and the south, both have usually uh, used and applied the soft power, essential soft power credentials from their parts, but Nepal is lagging in this matter. That's why it's a pressure to Nepal also. What are our soft powers and how can we mobilize them? That's the thing we have to study. And that's why in, the, in such a case, it is important. That's why objective is that this soft power adopted and applied by Nepal. What sort of soft power is applied and adopted by Nepal in present situation? And what sort of measuring uh, solution, solution will be there for promoting Nepal's soft power to the concerned authority, authorities we can provide? That is the uh, aim to do this. And for this explorative quality design have adopted and investigation linkage between soft power resources. And one thing is this. Soft power means just not only the resources, but what are the instruments and what are the receptions, how the other party has received the Nepal, Nepal soft power and what sort of outcomes are there by gaining Nepal. That sort of thing we have to do. And primary resources consider various treaties, agreements, and that sort of things also are also debated or also studied during this study. Uh, due to time constraint, I, am, uh, I want to go further. And I will the soft power in global context is that the place brand observer have mentioned that the, the three things familiarity and reputation and influence of a particular country will count as a soft power and the, the institution has studied upon it. Similarly, uh, another the global soft power index report, brand finance authority just has uh, indexed these uh, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven indicators are there, business and trend, trade, similarly governance, international relation and culture and heritage, media and communication, education and service, and place and values what sort of positions a particular country has gained in these parameters or in these indices that indicates the soft power of the particular country. Similarly, the soft power 30 report more than 19 uh, explains that enterprises, culture, digital, government, engagement, education, that sort of, these are the indicators to examine and to identify the soft power of a particular country. Is uh, soft power 30 report 19 mentioned that France was first, USA was the fifth, the ASEAN country, Japan and China, has secured the eighth and 27th position. Also, the soft power third report had mentioned that in Asian country, Japan is in first, South Korea is second, Singapore is in third, Taiwan, Taiwan, and so forth. That is given in the report. And this is also the you ranking uh, one parameter. You have 40 seconds to wrap up. Okay, I have to. And according to um, this resource instrument, reception, and outcomes, we have to uh, look and uh, um, these are the things, and uh, it's very long. Uh, let me try to control in a, within a minute only. Nepal soft power uh, reach, Nepal is really rich in culture, political values, and foreign policies. That is the thing. But my main thing is I want to uh, ex explain here is uh, the Buddha and Buddhism, which is especially coined and which is uh, born in Nepal. And uh, the another thing is that Mount Everest, these are Buddha, Buddhism, and Mount Everest, and this is the this is the places and another but, uh, your time limit is over so we can uh, discuss the uh, soft power of nepal uh, during our discussion okay okay thank you thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you so uh, vinod has uh, given us uh, the theoretical uh, perspective of soft power and hard power and uh, what can be done and what should be done uh, by Nepal to uh, enhance the soft power resources uh, that are there uh, in, uh, with Nepal. And I'm sure during the discussion, he will uh, elaborate a bit more on the soft power resources that Nepal has uh, that uh, they can uh, work on uh, to draw the international uh, and uh, international, uh, uh, attract the international community so that the world knows in what ways uh, Nepal uh, is uh, uh, you know, attractive uh, to, to the rest of the world. So uh, we will quickly go to our third uh, speaker that is Babita Sharma. Uh, Babita Sharma is a research scholar at the Institute of Advanced Communication, Education and Research, uh, research in Nepal. And she will be presenting uh, impact of social media on youth. Uh, Babita, if you're ready, you can start your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, special thanks to Nias 
uh, and Dr. Joshua sir for providing this opportunity to many of us. Uh, it is really wonderful, uh, creative and creative uh, program cond conducting by the NICE at, at this short pandemic situation, uh, situation. And the best part of NICE is that is trying to reach every corner of the world by blending the different issues and making distinguished persons involved and creating opportunity, different level of people. Thank you so much. Without saying this, I can't start my topic. Um, considering the time time limitations, so I'm going through uh, to my topic. Uh, my topic is very simple. Uh, everyone knows about this, and uh, so uh, social media and its impact, especially in the youth, is uh, very uh, being. Uh, very uh, going to very a uh, negative way, uh, and uh, it is uh, it has so many positive impacts. However, more positive impacts is uh, very less than negative impacts. So, going to the points, uh, social media. Why social media? What is the social media? Social media refers to interaction among people in which they create, share, and or extends information and ideas in virtual communities and networks. Uh, it refers to instinctual humans uh, have to connect with other humans. Why, why media? Uh, what is the media? Uh, what we use to make normally, like we are using the Zoom for this platform, like that way we, what we use to make connection with other humans uh, called uh, media. So social media used for social interactions. So it has um, um, so many, um, so many people are engaging in this platform. Not, uh, it is not, um, we can't say only to youth like uh, us, like we people are also uh, seems very busy every time in this um, social media, however, um, um, compared to the, the uh, compared to the uh, our maturity and the level of um, age, level of understanding, uh, youths are uh, going to uh, on negative track, and, uh, and they are very um, very difficult to the family members to control them. So, what is a uh, most of the youth are using WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, and other blogging platforms. And uh, more than half of the population is under 35 years of age and it's at the forefront of the mobile phone uh, revolution. More than 50% of youth in Metro City prefers WhatsApp and WeChat over SMS. Um, that increased irrational use, prank calls, unwanted messages, interactions. So some facts, um, um, social media stats in Nepal, um, uh, August, it, it, it is on the uh, August 2020, Facebook users are 97.14, YouTube 1.39%, uh, 1 uh, 1 Twitter 0.57% uh, and Instagram 0.12%. So um, popularity of um, Facebook and crazing craze of the Facebook users are very high in Nepal. Uh, this is the data according to um, social media, global stats. So it had so many negative effects rather than positive effects. So going through the negative effects first, then positive effects. Negative effects, case of cyberbullying, fake profiles have increased in use numbers. Throughout the youth are being manipulated with increase in use of websites. Teens who have Facebook more um, may have psychological disorder, including uh, antisocial behavior, mania, and aggressive tendencies can be distracted. People take Facebook, WhatsApp very frequently. The desire to compare 
it is a, in, it, it, this type of behavior increasing in, in the youth. Most of the people compares themselves to others in terms of looks, travel, destination, shopping, uh, spheres, uh, friends, and so on. Uh, radiation, radiation, another one is radiation, phone calls, internet over phone, even idle phone uh, has a lots of radiation around it. So it has um, issues, um, psychological and the physical problems, um, eye problems, prolonged use of display screen may weaken eye sights that is uh, facing uh, most of the youth. Um, um, addiction, internet shopping, online chatting uh, can be the can be addictive, um, and they are they are um, feeling. Um, they are being very, uh, I mean, uh, VIP, I mean, superior when they use the such type of um, uh, media uh, mode. Effects on health, sitting all day in front of laps, laptops, computers may disturb body metabolism, um, which is, of a, which is uh, facing all of the parents uh, in our Nepal, Nepali context. Reduction of physical activities, behavioral change, tendency to, to be alone, anxiety problems, privacy issues, stress, hypertension, aggression, and violation, violence are the negative effects. Um, these are the negative effects by using the social media. And however, it has some points, uh, very less points uh, under positive effects. Health in conversation around the world data information can be exchanged easily money over sms can be saved by using whatsapp or facebook messenger etc information can be directly sent to large number of people easily helps in avoiding boredom a local business person may expand their business over websites and another point uh, is very important cyberbullying uh, direct bullying and indirect bullying. Two types of bullying is there. Uh, direct bullying uh, is a, you need to wrap up. Uh, okay, done by men and um, indirect bullying done by girls. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity provided to us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Babita, for your presentation. Uh, you know, am I audible? Yes, 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 okay. yes. So uh, while we are talking extensively on foreign policies and the changing world order and the world affairs, it's very important to also focus on the social media because it's, it's one medium uh, that uh, reaches out to almost every corner uh, because technologically we have internet and we have uh, uh, smartphones. So it is very easily accessible. And it's very, very much reachable to people uh, to change ideologies, be it political or religious. So it's very important. Uh, it's a very important aspect that you have touched upon. And later on, I would like to uh, listen a bit more on how it is affecting the Nepal, uh, Nepalese youth and what can be done to control this situation uh, in a more feasible manner. Our fourth speaker is Shweta Khartka. Uh, she's a graduate from the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, Three Bhuvan University. And she'll be speaking on China's soft power diplomacy in Nepal and BRI. Shweta, you can start now. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for the platform. And I would want to thank the uh, pre other presenters and the host. Uh, so before uh, wasting any time, I would jump into my presentation. Uh, uh, I want to share my screen. Is my screen visible to other presenters and other participants? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So uh, as introduced uh, by the presenter, I will be talking about China's soft power, speci specifically in relation to Nepal and in the backdrop of BRI. Uh, so um, the major highlights of my presentation will be, I'll be uh, 
exploring the concept of uh, soft power and linking that with how China is adapting to that concept and how it is altering the definition of soft power to blend into its own idea, ideologies and the global uh, context of political atmosphere right now. Uh, so um, the concept of BRI was, uh, BRI was introduced, it's a multi-faceted project and we are all aware of it because it has um, gained a global momentum. It's a very large infrastructure project. However, it also includes a lot of aspect of soft power because China aims to uh, build Can anyone hear? I think we got disconnected. Should we yeah. move to the next speaker then while she yes, connects? Because I think there was internet issues even here. So I also got disconnected. So we, uh, we, we uh, continue with Shivaram Rijal, right? Yes, we just need to take some time to connect. Okay, Shivaram Rijal, are you, are you ready? I'll quickly uh, introduce you then. Yes, Vicky, I'm here. Okay, so uh, we will uh, continue with Shivaram Rijal. He's a PhD candidate at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy at Tribhuvan University, Nepal. And he will be presenting on India's neighborhood policy, first policy and Nepal. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, NIICE, my niece for providing me this opportunity. And I would like to say my greetings to all of my fellow panelists and all the audiences who are listening here and through YouTube and uh, Facebook live. It's me, Sivaram Rizal. I'm uh, currently as a PhD student under uh, Tribune University Department of International Relations and Diplomacy. Today, I will be paper that I think uh, some work on Indian foreign policy shift and for all these, uh, I will be particularly concentrating upon India's neighborhood first policy and Nepal. Considering the time limits and technical glitches, I will prefer to speak than showing my, uh, my, my slides. So I, I will be happy to get your uh, constructive feedbacks as well as uh, would, would love to have interaction. Going, going to the initial point, point to my presentation, uh, it's about uh, my, my presentation is my, uh, my part of the uh, paper consider Narendra Modi's government's new initiative that has come in Indian foreign policy policy as a shift. Uh, taking you all back to 2014 when there was a swearing in inviting all the head of the government, head of the uh, state's government of SARC in Narendra Modi's sharing in was considered as one of the, one of the important aspects that Narendra Modi wa wanted to diversify Indian foreign policy. Second is the diplomatic dealing he started, particularly, uh, particularly engaging with the neighbors, just like engaging with Bhutan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Even in case of Sri Lanka and Nepal, he visited after a long period of gap. So, so coming to my, uh, my, my part of the paper, that whether Narendra Modi government's neighborhood first policy, Narendra Modi government's foreign policy is in track or not in relation with Nepal. And I am arguing that India's neighborhood first policy has lost its way guided by some strategic interest and it has come to, to some sort of failure that I, I argue that India's approach to Nepal needs restructuring. For all these things, I, I, I would like to illustrate some of the points where uh, I have seen several contradictions, contradictions that uh, India's neighborhood first policy and, uh, and the, the behavior has been 
in Narendra Modi's government period, particularly after um, 2040. The very initial point that it started is that was that in Nepal's uh, yes, I, I I just take a, some positive points that when Narendra Modi uh, visited Nepal in 2014, he got so overwhelming support and and then the, 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 the public support as well as government support. The, the, his speech, his speech, he has given to the constitution constituent assembly in Nepal that he promised to solve all the outstanding problems between India and Nepal once for all, but there are several contradictions. His Narendra Modi government, Narendra Modi spoke so very valuable points, but the, the, there are differences in what he, his government has done. Right from the beginning, Indian displeasure uh, come to the surface when the, the Nepal, Nepal took a decisive uh, action in constitution promulgation, in which I would like to cite uh, Professor S.D. Muni that it was some sort of diplomatic, um, uh, misconduct and then that followed by economic blockade though india never uh, never accepted it was an uh, indian blockade but but the, the fact and the situation has a direct correlation between what indian uh, indian government's uh, issues at that time and what happened uh, what happened i mean to the in these two uh, points Shivaram, i only have one minute left only that okay so all these i coming to the coming back the, the formation of EPJ, it was good, but the reluctance of the, getting the report, uh, current, current crisis that Nepal and India are going, all in all these things are India's uh, reluctance to solve the problem has been seen. So, so there are some ways out. What, I, what my, my article talks about is that the overcoming all the trust deficit, uh, unveiling, unveiling the EPJ report, report can give way in Nepal-India relations. And coming to the conclusion, though India's India's neighborhood first policy was appreciated in early early days, but there are several contradictions that 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 is almost almost uh, in, in the case of uh, the present ongoing crisis between India and Nepal must be resolved, taking it with uh, urgent attention and considering respect to each other on mutual benefits and mutual, considering respect on mutual uh, interest, interest over each other. And another important point that the China, perceived China threat in Nepal um, uh, developed, uh, illustrated by Indian media and all those things are, I believe, are that they are based on some sort of false perception. The logic behind this is China is not only in Nepal, but China's influence and presence is all over the world and mostly in Indian vicinity. That, that, is, what I, uh, that is what I have observed. And so in order to, to make all the, uh, the, in order to bring back the situation, which once it was historic, it was unique and, uh, and culturally, geographically linked between India and Nepal, it could be, but uh, for all these things, the uh, bilateral so can you wrap up? bring back the state. Thank you very much, and I appreciate for your feedback as well as I hope to interact and if you have any concerns and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shivaram. It's a very, very important topic that we had to touch upon, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, on this. Um, yeah. So we will quickly uh, go to the next speaker. Simran Napit, she's a student at the Kathmandu School of Law, Nepal, and she'll be speaking on derogation of human rights during state of emergency. Uh, Simran, are you ready? Yes, thank okay, you. Then. Please thank go you ahead. So, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all for your consideration. And I really appreciate this opportunity. And I'd like to take a few moments to thank Nice Team and also especially Dr. Pramod Jeshwal for organizing this kind of summit for young scholar like us. We really do appreciate this. So moving on, I will be presenting on derogation of human rights during state of emergency. And I think this is one of the fundamental issue to be talk about because uh, due to pandemic that is COVID-19, most of the human rights have been challenged. Like uh, as a reality check, we can see like all of us, we are at our homes and each one of us, we are dealing with 
fundamental right, that is right to life. And in one hand, there is COVID-19. And in another hand, there are like certain measures that should, be, that should be taken to protect our fundamental right, that is right to life. And along with this right, there are a few other rights, like right to freedom of expression, right to, you know, freedom of religion, right to, uh, you know, fair trial, and some other socioeconomic rights, like you have like right to health, right to housing, right to water, right to food, right to hygiene, etc. So regarding the restriction of this right, state has given certain power, and that means the exceptionary power for the state under international law and under the human rights treaty. And yes, now we know that the state has certain power to derogate or restrict our certain rights of the people. Then this does not mean that like it is a blank check for the state. I repeat, this is not the blank check of the state that it can fill up any numbers to it. Rather, the state should be very much concerned about the core element regarding derogation of rights. And the core elements are the first one is necessity. That means all the measures that the state take should be as for the necessary measures against fighting the pandemic. And the second one is the legitimacy. That means all the actions the state does should be under the law. And as a human being and as a responsible citizen, we all have the right to know that what kind of rights have been restricted. And the third one is a very important principle in human rights. That is a principle of proportionality. This means that there should be the meaningful relationship between the health emergencies and the rights that have been restricted. So having said this, I would like to raise a very simple question to the floor. That what are we seeing right now and what are we facing? Okay, like if I ask some of the members in the panel that how is your pandemic going on? Then some might say that, yes, I'm having a good time because this pandemic, like I can spend a good time with my family. And some might say that I am self-discovering like I'm getting lots of time for my self-care, for my workout. And like, if I ask Pramodji, he might say that, yeah, I'm busy like organizing this kind of important summits and that's good. But the main thing that we need to understand is that this pandemic, that, that is a, a global response. That means we all are responsible to fight with this pandemic and we all should be aware of the restrictions of our right. So at a time, we are facing two things. So I'll make it easy for you. That is, we are like facing right and restrictions at the same time. That is why it comes up with certain challenges. So the challenge number one is about the proclamation challenge. That means like, can we ask ourselves that, do we really know or are we really aware that what our state is doing? Yes, that is a first challenge. That means all the action that state takes should be proclaimed. Like some of the state has proclaimed state of emergency, but some they are still like they are still confused and there is de facto kind of state of emergency. But then also as a responsible citizen, we need to be aware that what our state is doing and what kind of power state is using. And the second most challenge is about the pandemic itself. That means the pandemic might be of short term, but the effect that it might create is, can be of long term. Who knows that the effect can be the DNA of each state, like who knows, right? Uh, so this is a challenge that we need to cope up with. So at the last, what I want to say is that we might, you know, a bit this pandemic, health pandemic, but if we do not really care about these elements that I talk about, then trust me, seriously, we are going to have the crisis of law and rule of law soon after the pandemic ends. So uh, I would like to like aware all the people regarding this and thank you so much for your, you know, consideration. Thank you for listening and watching me. Thank you and namaste. Thank you so much, Simran. Uh, you have in fact uh, ended before time. So I'll give you extra time, time during the discussion session. And uh, what you have highlighted is, is indeed very uh, important because you have highlighted the legitimacy and the importance of rights, of human rights as we know it. And health emergency is a global issue and it demands global response. It cannot be faced in isolation. And human rights, as we have it right now, needs to be revised as in how much we are getting as citizens and needs a little bit more retrospection uh, from the state. So very good presentation, Simran.
uh, we will now move on to the next uh, speaker who is Manisha Mahalingam. Uh, Manisha is a risk analyst with India Bound and she will be speaking on analyzing the need for trilateral flood management system between India, Nepal and Bangladesh. Please, uh, you can start your presentation. Am I audible? I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, you are audible. Please start. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that introduction. Uh, I said my name is uh, Man uh, Manisha Mahalingam, and uh, my topic is analyzing the need for a trilateral flood management system between India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. My paper explores the shortcomings of the existing framework, flood management framework in the respective countries and emphasizes a need for a trilateral efficient regional cooperation. So why, uh, why this uh, study is because we have been witnessing a high level of human sufferings and loss of life caused because of the floods and this year coupled with the pandemic the situation has only worsened so my argument is that the interdependencies between the three nations necessitates a trilateral flood management system why these three states is because of the unique geography bangladesh india nepal are connected by the common river system of the ganges Brahmaputra, and the megana uh, and the gvm region also happens to be one of the most disaster prone regions in the world it faces landslides floods glaciers melting erosions a lot of a uh, lot of natural disasters that make this region extremely vulnerable and severest of them all being the floods uh, the numbers projected on the screen are uh, some of the are the loss to life and uh, property that was witnessed in the short duration of July to August in the year 2020. We can see how in this very small period, over 2.4 billion people being affected, million people being affected just in the state of Assam. Uh, and significantly, this is not uh, there. There's also very significant and crucial trends that are, that has been happening, transpiring over the years when it comes to the floods in the GBM region. In, in despite there being a fewer number of fatalities over the years, we are also seeing a larger number of people being displaced, evacuated, or stranded. And this is and this is heightened by the climate change because there is. A frequent uh, sudden rains and floods which makes the already inefficient flood management system more inefficient. The respective countries do have their own uh, dedicated and well-defined nodal authorities be it for flood management or uh, flood forecast uh, authorities and their measures have, are largely and broadly can be categorized into structural measures such as you know building up of reservoirs strengthening embankments uh, non-structural measures such as um, flood forecasting flood warning and catchment area treatments so what is the problem when there is already a well-defined uh, flood management flood protection system the problem is that the approach to flood governance has been largely confined to territorial jurisdictions when it comes to these three states domestic framework for instance for examples as india's um, scheme on uh, scheme which is uh, titled river management activities and works related to border areas whose primary work is to look into the river uh, flood management and flood protection work in the uh, rivers that border India and Bangladesh. This is a very domestic framework that does not involve the participation of other, other countries. Bilateral frameworks also exist, uh, particularly between India and Nepal. We have three joint committee uh, committees, the most important of them being the Joint Committee on Inundation and Flood Management. Uh, India Bangladesh have the Indo-Bangla uh, Joint River Committee. So there is an existing bilateral framework whose primary work is flood warning, flood management, uh, flood forecasting, uh, which shows to us or brings to light that there is uh, an existing practice of sharing of information, sharing of workload, sharing of collaboration when it comes to flood management. However, this have a lot of shortcomings in this uh, in this as well. We see that 
these measures both taken under the domestic framework or the bilateral framework are largely confined to structural measures such as strengthening of embankments or dams which does not really uh, give a very long term vision or over a, or um, does not resolve the problems of the floods that we are witnessing now secondly is the structural measures that are taken up sporadic or not sustainable the bilateral understandings also excludes the other stakeholders rains in nepal and bangla india consequently affect bangladesh and to exclude the third country uh, does does not is not really very efficient multilateral framework is a failure when we speak about multilateral framework we can speak about the sarc disaster management center uh, however it is has done not much uh, when it comes to the flood flood the disasters in in uh, the sarc nations if you go on to the into their website right now you will find it page dedicated to covid 19 but nothing related to the floods even though all the sarc countries are currently facing or have faced uh, recently uh, you know record breaking floods So, so this obviously necessitates a trilateral flood management system right but it should not be a trilateral flood management system that mirrors the these bilateral frameworks or uh, domestic frameworks because they have because they have already failed to be efficient this trilateral system must be unique to the geography and the necessity of the region and i have highlighted highlighted certain features that i believe should be part of this trilateral system uh most importantly being to encourage the citizen forums citizen forums uh, are playing a very crucial role right now in early warning when it comes to early warning during the floods an example would be an ngo named lutheran relief flood which claims to have helped benefited over 25000 people by just connecting the local communities which brings us to the next point that we must include and communicate with the communities these uh, existing flood management frameworks in these countries are uh, collaborate or share information at a very national level and it does not filter down to the communities who are the first and the most affected we can also harness the digital transformation that uh, the pandemic has hastened we if we can harness the we, people are already uh, becoming more digitalized and we can harness this power and we more crucial is to address one of the uh, uh, backdraws of our flood management forecasting being you know bringing together rainfall data and rainfall modeling and river monitoring uh, for instance the bihar floods were caused by flash floods that happened because of heavy rains in nepal if the people in bihar were were aware of the heavy rains in in the lowlands of nepal they could have averted the disaster so there is a gap in information sharing a gap in the data that have been collected there is also a lack in uniformity in both technology and data so these authorities of respective countries do have real time data on their websites however these data is of different formats so interpretation of these data is is not smooth and hence not efficient technology too are very varied and different if if we were to collaborate into trilateral understanding we can you know bring we can make it more easy for ourselves to interpret and to filter down this information to all communities uh, state and stakeholders uh, finally a question that i have to wrap up you have uh, 15 seconds left has my time ended it's almost ending yeah you you finish it <laughs> okay so the last point that i just want to conclude with is who can initiate this uh, trilateral understanding the obvious answer would be india because you know, because being of uh, being the dominant nation but i would say that bangladesh is in a better standing for reasons being that a they are the most affected all the three rivers uh, the gbm rivers go end up and cause the most destruction in bangladesh and also bangladesh will bring to the table will not bring to the table the self importance that india perhaps would bring and hence any conflict can be easily resolved if bangladesh was leading the conversation the discussion towards a trilateral system and with that i conclude thank you Thank you so much, Manisha, for ending almost on time. We have uh, Dr. Shanawas Manto as our next speaker. Dr. Shanawas Manto is a IC SSR postdoctoral fellow at the Kashmir University, and he will be presenting on Indian neighborhood policy, new developments, and confrontation. uh dr manto are you ready 
Yeah, yeah, I am ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Respected chair and other uh, colleagues, good evening to everyone. And I am very much thankful to Dr. Jaswal sir for giving me this opportunity and uh, to the institute as well and to other colleagues. Uh, so uh, my paper is on India's neighborhood policy, new developments and confrontations. So I will uh, read out some excerpts from the paper which I have already sent to the institute. Uh, some important developments, I will discuss with you some important developments. So Indian foreign policy has undergone several shifts since uh, independence from non-alignment to alignment and again it has taken a new turn to aspire for global power and global reach. Uh, uh, despite all this, the post of uh, the past of Indian foreign policy or particularly the Indian neighborhood policy has seen money or experienced many ups and downs and the present too is very facing uh, present too is seriously facing money uh, upheavals and the future of Indian neighborhood policy is fraught with money, serious security and non-security challenges. So I have divided the Indian foreign neighborhood policy into four phases, but I will stick to the uh, last phase, that's the Modi's phase, since which has started in 2014. So the post-2014 initial phase of India's foreign policy towards neighbors was characterized by an idea of neighborhood first, an integrated South Asia, greater emphasis on soft power, multi-alignment with great powers, willingness to engage with dial in dialogue with uh, neighbors and particularly with Pakistan. However, at the substantial level, Modi's neighborhood policy has been in doldrums and it's not neighborhood first, but I stress on it, but it's neighborhood lost. You can use both words LOST or LAST. In both cases, it's uh, a neighborhood lost. Despite making an impressive start, whether it is a neighborhood first policy, the Modi government is increasingly battling resentment in the region. Modi's domestic policy is purely based on Hindu, major Hindu to a majoritarianism. Therefore, neighborhood policy is also suffering from Hindu majoritarian tendencies. In the past, Indian leaders have always tried to spread democracy across South Asian states. However, over the years, India under Modi has lost their democratic influence uh, uh, within its backyard. The personalized and authoritarian kind of conduct of foreign policy by Modi government leaves both India and neighborhood short uh, change. Uh, Ultranationalists have gained ground in New Delhi. It has escalated further in neighborhood. Modi doctrine is a mix of political calculations, a complete control of diplomacy by the prime minister, and an enthusiastic willingness to fret for the Western world. It's totally answered, uncaring towards the sovereignties and sensibilities of the neighborhood countries and marked by a complete lack of historicity and economic foresight. So I will come to the uh, first case, that's Pakistan. So as you know, India and Pakistan were birthed out of a bloody partition that encouraged each to define itself in opposition to uh, the other. New developments have taken place, which have added new troubles to the bilateral uh, the scenario between India and Pakistan. You, I may come to the uh, first, uh, there's a Kashmir case. Kashmir is both internal and external security for India. Kashmir is not only a bilateral issue, it's a Delhi Srinagar. Kashmir, Siri, Kashmir Delhi issue as well. Its impact on India Pakistan relations, it has impacted on South Asian region, impact on SARC. And lately, with the abrogation of special status, constitutional status, which was granted to the Jomo and Kashmir states under uh, Indian constitution, new developments have taken place. Uh, for example, ag aggression from China on LAC, on Ladakh. International, internationalization of Kashmir issue, death of mainstream politics in Kashmir, more alienation of local people, frequent ceasefire violation or, on LOC, new breed of separatist sentiment in Kashmir, emergence of China as third player of the issue. The major decision of abrogation has created more internal and external security challenges to India. The China's aggression is being directly linked with the abrogation. The Indian state is 
now facing two front war as said by the bipin rawat during his recent uh, ladakh visit the war from the eastern and western side and second is the terrorism and immediate impact of this standing from indian side on terrorism that terrorism and talks cannot go together and its immediate impact is on dialogue and this policy which was which has been adopted by uh, delhi is suffering from serious elements and the third is uh, another important development which has taken place which is a disastrous india's neighborhood policy is the death of sarat as a functional organization india pakistan frozen relations have seriously made the sark redundant weak sark is not in the interest of region nor is it in the interest of uh, this india bad neighborhood policy of modi government has resulted in the failure of sark sark is the biggest onus lies with the uh, this india uh, uh, to make uh, this sark functional sark is the only region only regional palate forum through which india could have contained china and uphold its presence in other parts of the south asian region so coming to the next uh, this uh, uh, area that's bangladesh so bangladesh as you know is uh, uh, was part of undivided pakistan and it came into existence as a new part uh, of south asia on the basis of cultural nationalism bangladesh is very critical to uh, indian security or the development of northeast and the success of its new act east policy but however these strategic geo strategic and geopolitical considerations were not taken into consideration this new developments have taken place in india bangladesh relations which are worrying some developments the issue of controversial citizenship law ca cwa nrc other regional powers are now taking advantage of the rift to gain a foothold at india's doorstep the caa and rc has been heavily criticized in its muslim majority bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan as stoking demographic tensions between muslims and hindus as part of a hindu nationalist agenda uh, so she has Sheikh... almost one minute okay madam i will conclude uh, so uh, uh, modi's neighborhood policy is suffering from different elements modi government has recently gone with this cnrc one important issue cnrc had uh, negative impact on three islamic muslim states uh, bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan abrogation of 370 again a disaster domestically as well as externally it worsened india pakistan relations china emerged as a third player continued ladakh peace off is also the result of this abrogation economic blockade in nepal and subsequent events have greatly damaged the bonhomi nepal in india nepal bonhomi and the emerging footprints of china which is worrying for india and it's because of the disastrous modi's doctrine modi's foreign policy china is now present and i was you need to conclude okay ma'am yes conclude the time is over okay thank you madam i am highly thankful to the institute and to dr jaiswal and to the other organizing committee for giving me this opportunity thank you ma'am Thank you so much, Shanawas, for your presentation. Uh, we had missed uh, Shweta Khatka due to some technical problems, and I think she's back right now. And I would like to uh, request Shweta to continue with her presentation. Shweta, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Uh, so sorry for the technical errors. No problem. Please, you can start now. Okay. Yeah. uh so yes um i'll be talking about uh soft power in uh, i'll be introducing soft power the concept and i'll be thinking with uh, china's uh soft power in relation against the backdrop of bri in nepal uh so yes um bri is a multifaceted project we're all aware of that and it's it's the largest infrastructure project of the decade and it symbolizes china's unprecedented growth and uh, there are more than 125 nations participating in this project 
uh, linking that with uh, soft power, uh, China has been, uh, along with the hard infrastructure projects of bridges and roads and other trade links, it has also uh, channeled a lot of funds in developing uh, soft power and, and extending its soft power to its uh, member nations. Uh, the concept of soft power was introduced by Joseph Nye, who has underpinned three aspects uh, as the main constraints of um, soft power, which is culture, political values, and foreign uh, foreign policies and now we'll be um uh we'll be uh wow. discussing on how these concepts uh china has been using to extend its foreign policy uh in terms of expanding its uh, soft power uh soft power wow. and soft power di diplomacy it has been a major uh, push uh, of all nations uh, foreign policy in the present context um, it does uh, soft power bears a very close link with uh, liberalism because the con because it 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 elaborates more on the softer nature of the power rather than the hard power uh, which is military and economic uh, for the discussing about nice uh, concept of the uh, soft power we can see that the concept does bear a link with linkages with other concepts which was proposed by eh car and uh, gramsci uh, also, Nye has coined the term soft power, but you know, when we look into the definition of it, it does bear linkages with other um, international uh, scholars who have been contributed in various schools of thought. Um, uh, so I'm narrowing down into two broad schools of thought, which are the major uh, schools of thought in IR theories, uh, linking that with realism and liberalism. From realism, we have E.H. Kari is a prominent uh, thinker of realism, and he defines uh, power where he has uh, strictly uh, defined power in three terms, military, economic, and power of opinion. Uh, while, we, while looking at liberalism, we see, uh, we see the liberalists focusing more on the aspect of freedom and liberty. Uh, so. Uh, comparing these two schools of thought in terms of the soft power, uh, we see that the um, concept proposed by E.H. Carr also has an element of soft power in, in it. Uh, so uh, the concept of soft power is not entirely new and it does bear a linkage with other former international scholars. Um, and like uh, he has clearly stated that the power of opinion is also a, is also a, a very important uh, part of power and which if we uh, extend that to in terms of understanding so, uh, soft power it does has a link with uh, aspect of human psychology and perception and all of those softer aspects and which again it relates to the art of persuasion which 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 basically describes the nature of soft power so although coming from a realist school of thought we have scholars who have identified and who have actually um, uh, elaborated and acknowledged the concept of soft power. Uh, and coming down to the Gramsci's approach, uh, he, he talks about a hegemonic school of thought and here also he clearly mentions that uh, the principal constituting uh, elements are the consent and persuasion rather than coercion. So uh, for any uh, he he hegemonic power to extend and um, to maintain its influence in the world power, it does, it does need that consent and persuasion from the other actors and other stakeholders. So even here we see the aspect of soft power being projected in its in his definition. So uh, soft power in total is not a new concept, rather it is in my of course coined the term, but it's it's its linkages were there from the realist realist school of thought to the Gramsci school of thought. So uh, it is an integral part of power and has been uh, an integral part of power since the international relations have been practicing for a very long time. So we clearly see the um, commonality of soft power in Gramsci's concept, in E.H. Carr's concept, and in Nye's concept. Um, so here is how uh, I have uh, overlapped this uh, com com component of power in these three concepts. Uh, now coming down to China and its um, methods of uh, soft power. Uh, uh, it was um, it was in the 1990s, late 1990s, when China decided to go for open door policy and when it when it uh, actually opened its gates for the, um, the global presence in its uh, nation's economy and other political structures. So it was then the uh, concept of soft power also um, slowly started building in in political fabric of China. It was in 1990s the upsurge of the interest in concept of soft power was seen at China's strategic level and academic level. Uh, they had also coined the um, 
term ruined Chile as soft power, and they were pressing on that aspect to, uh, as in a very integral part of China's uh, strategy to go global. And uh, BRI is a very integral part of that uh, global presence of China's foreign policy, and hence soft power is is then become then becomes a very integral part of BRI. So these three uh, things are very closely connected. China's decision to Go, uh, to go global along with altering its uh, foreign policy in line with uh, soft power. It tells, um, it tells the world that China is actually um, making that choice deliberately to expand its soft power. Uh, some of the measures it has used to uh, expand its soft power tools are investment, peacekeeping, exchange programs, diplomacy, and multilateral in institutions. So all of these components is present in, uh, in, in BRI in some level or the other, depending on the uh, nation, the member nation, depending on the political, geographical, economic uh, context of the member nation. China has been accordingly uh, curating its uh, foreign policy to adjust these aspects. But um, China soft power is definitely a great, uh, it, it's of great value in BRI in, in itself. Um, so yes, Nepal and uh, China, they got in uh, BRI in, from the year 2017, and there are a lot of hard, pro hard line projects of build of, of various, uh, bridge, various development projects uh, listed under BRI. Also, in parallel to that, we see a lot of uh, cultural exchanges and other lot of uh, investments in areas where China is interested to uh, build the soft relation with nation and, um, and grow its cultural values in the country. But like have uh, one minute left. Okay. So, uh, so yes, basically China and Nepal, they are investing their time and energy to build its soft power relations. But one thing, uh, one major critique of Chinese soft power expansion is that uh, China's illiberal political values will fringe upon uh, its, uh, its attempt to uh, expand its uh, soft power. That is one critique that, uh, that China has been facing. And the other critique is that uh, soft power cannot really be uh, state funded. Since a lot of projects, um, since a lot of initiatives are state-led in terms of uh, expanding this soft power. The critics are of view that uh, soft power is something that it, it, should, um, it should evolve organically. It, it should come from people organically with their uh, acceptance and with their attraction to the nation's values and ideologies. But in this, in China's case, it, is, it seems like it's, um, it's been state-funded and it's state-supported. So this, the, the long-term sustainability true. of the... Yes, so basically, this is what I have to present in China Nepal soft power relations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shweta. You have uh, beautifully explained soft power and uh, how uh, soft power should come organically and it should not be state imposed, uh, which is a beautiful uh, concept to share with. And, and, and the state leaders and international leaders uh, should uh, try to follow uh, such kind of an uh, approach uh, for more people-to-people -people connection. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So as our thank last so much, speaker, as our last speaker, we have Liana Dashian. Uh, she's a project coordinator at the Global Youth Union Armenia, and she will be presenting on China's engagement in the European Union. Thank you, uh, Liana. Your, your time starts now. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, NIIC for this uh, initiative and for this uh, opportunity. Um, and I have prepared a small um, paper on um, as you know, European relations uh and pandemic it's titled you know european relations and, and the pandemic um so i i divided it into three parts um so what was uh, about their relations during, uh, before pandemic um the second part is about uh so european and uh, chinese relations uh, during pandemic and um, the prospectives after the pandemic is the third part. Um, so I, I made it uh, really short. Um, so um, 
uh, Sino European relations, um, bilateral relations started in 1975. Uh, in fact, um, they uh, were very happy to celebrate the 45th anniversary in 2020, uh, but uh, pandemic uh, occurred and uh, so their relations are going to be changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, uh, they were doing very, uh, very well. Uh, European Union was the second largest uh, trading partner for uh, China after the United States and uh, China was the largest trading partner for the EU. Um, of course, uh, they have um, several uh, disagreements. Um, um, so European Union uh, uh, has uh, some issues with uh, human rights uh, in China and how they treat with um, uh, with foreigners. Uh, they are giving uh, lands cheaper uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, locals than to Europeans. So uh, there are a series of uh, uh, issues. Um, that I will talk about later. <clears throat> so during the pandemic, uh, there was cooperation and uh, China in April 11, uh, China um, at the beginning of uh, pandemic, um, China Europe freight uh, train loaded with medical supplies was sent to Europe. Um, and a lot of advices were given. And uh, before that, uh, there was the One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, Belgrade and uh, Budapest train line uh, uh, was planned and uh, China uh, investments uh, were there in, uh, for Europe. Um, of course, Northern Europe was uh, more um, defensive uh, but uh, there are a lot of investments in um, Italy and Greece. Um, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, coming to the third part uh, of, um, of my presentation. Um, uh, so, in fact, uh, European Union has a financial crisis. Um, they are not, um, they will have uh, problems with uh, finances. Uh, and on the other side, China will have problems. It has already problems with soft uh, uh, issues, uh, mainly uh, related to um, work migrants, uh, they have the uh, minority, mostly minorities that are being uh, um, so they uh, so that they they are not in good conditions. And in um, uh, Europe, there is a propaganda that uh, not to buy uh, Chinese uh, goods because of these issues. Um, so there are a lot of problems um, uh, with China in, in terms of Hong Kong, national security legislation, um, etc. Um, uh, so, but uh, both sides admit that they have to have good relations for uh, stability and peace in uh, um, in the world, mm, uh, uh, but this uh, everything is uh, not letting uh, them to have the trade uh, treaty that was supposed to happen at the end of 2020. Um, uh, maybe 90 and 10 uh, percent that it will happen. Uh, because of a lot of problems um, between two parts and um, European Union cannot uh, close eyes um, for a lot of issues China has. 
um, and um, China also has to come to compromise with uh, European Union. Uh, so, um, Uh, so, but on, on the other hand, uh, there are some um, facts that uh, make Europe maybe to go for it because, uh, for example, in Germany, Angela Merkel uh, will have uh, uh, will participate in the elections and uh, at the end of the year, and this is the only um, uh, fact that maybe. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, last chance uh, uh, for her to succeed uh, during the elections. Um, so let's see uh, what will be at the end of the year, but uh, what uh, is important that bo both sides uh, should have good cooperation. Um, uh, for stability and peace in the world. Uh, thank you, and I will stop here. Thank you, Liana, for ending on time. It was a very good presentation. And we are uh, at the end, almost at the end of the session with uh, Liana's uh, presentation. And I will now, because we have quite a few questions that have uh, been uh, sent through uh, YouTube and other mediums for our speakers. So I will uh, open the floor for question answer and discussions. And we will try to have a all inclusive, comprehensive um, discussion. Uh, and then I will, in the end, I will end with my uh, comments. So, uh, I think the first question that we have is for Binod. Okay, uh, Binod has a question. It has been sent uh, from YouTube. Uh, that could you please state in points what are Nepal's soft powers, uh, soft powers like the soft power resources that Nepal has? Uh, would you like to? Yes, uh, um, uh, ma'am, I'm going to just uh, mention in a uh, few minutes, one minute, two minutes only. Sure. Uh, Nepal to have various sort of sort of power, or as I uh, tried to mention in my presentation also, basically I want to focus on a political value, which is very unique one. Uh, Nepal has experienced and established attractive political values as a fusion of capitalism and socialism. It's a very unique one. In its constitution, it has uh, kept there by fusing the two uh, contradictory uh, philosophies in one uh, understanding. That is one uh, thing. And another thing is Nepal's effort to solve armed conflict has proven to be a unique Nepali model in peace and conflict literature. We should not forget it. For instance, uh, in September 2018, Afghan High Level Peace Council Deputy Chief and her mission and uh, former minister, Hadiba Saravi, and her delegation was visited Nepal to learn from Nepal's peace process. So, he has to guide the peace process in Afghanistan. That's why the Nepali model, uh, the peace model of Nepal is uh, a bit spreading all over the um, world. Probably, it, it may be the helpful for the conflict suffering countries. That's why it is a political. Uh, one sort of uh, political uh, achievement or soft power of Nepal in political value. Similarly, in public diplomacy and uh, personal diplomacy also, just uh, recently, uh, the American ideal, uh, second runner, so the first runner of, um, uh, so has just owned by on Nepal's um, why, uh, what, uh, what his name is, uh, um, uh, name is, um, Pokhrels, something Pokhrel is there, and uh, uh, Arthur Gan is the uh, literature name, literature name in, uh, in there. And another Manish Aguilar also, what, what she commented on Twitter, that sort of uh, celebrity diplomacy also, some sort of thing are there. And the zone of peace proposal of King Birendra, that is, uh, uh, that was also a very useful and very important key um, personal diplomacy in the past. That's a, there are so many um, soft powers, but 
yet to establish in a uh, research manner and the appropriate format it is yet to come. That's why we need to do uh, research and we need to format it in a research pattern. That's my uh, response regarding the question, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Binod. You are actually right. And uh, it has been for a long time, we know that India is the largest country in the region and India is full of soft power resources. However, I think the time has come then when the, uh, the neighboring smaller countries, be it Bangladesh or Nepal or Sri Lanka, need to highlight and bring back and realize their potential and their soft power resources. Every country has something or the other. And this is the time when the world is more connected. This is the time when the world appreciates interconnectedness and other resources. So it, it's, it's about time that Nepal uh, should and should find out ways to uh, highlight and work on their uh, resources as, as you have mentioned. So uh, the next question is for Simran. Uh, how can we stop powerful states using human rights as a geopolitical tool? Simran, this question is for you. Do we have Simran with us? Okay, I will go to the next question. I think Binod, okay, Binod's question we have asked. We have a question for Dr. Mantu. Uh, the question is, India has neighborhood first. India yeah, yeah, has yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. You have read the question? Would you like to answer it? No, ma'am, please repeat the question. Okay. India has neighborhood first. India has Pakistan, China as well as Bhutan, Pakistan, Bangladesh as neighbor. Which neighbor comes first for India? Is it possible to keep all neighbors in the same plane? No, it's not possible. As far as my understanding goes, it's not possible for India to keep all neighbors in a single plane. However, it is possible for India that they may maintain a good neighborly relations with every other neighbor because every are uh, this india's relation with its neighbors for example with pakistan it has a, a different kind of context and different kind of it's characterized by different kind of characters with bangladesh it has different kind of historical background cultural nuances and other dimensions uh, with Nepal, it has different kind of context, different kind of history, different kind of uh, bilateral bonhomie, different kind of geographical positions, geostrategic positions. So we cannot say that India can keep every neighbor, all, all neighbors in a single plane. That's not possible. Keeping in consideration the differences which are there, but India can maintain neighborly, good neighborly relations with every neighbor, with every, as has been done in the past. See the Gujral doctrine, where the element of reciprocity was there, invoked. But this time since 2014, how the problem with the Indian foreign policy has been that it has not been conscious about the sensitivities and other important areas which it's uh, within its own backyard. That is the problem with it. And the policies and programs which the government of India has adopted domestically has not been received well by other neighbors. For example, Pakistan, abrogation 370, NRC, CA, Afghanistan, and uh, this, uh, uh, this Bangladesh. Are other policies which are, at, for example, the economic blockade against uh, Nepal? Otherwise, India Nepal relations should have been largely good. So, therefore, India cannot keep all the neighbors in a single plane. However, they can maintain good neighborly relations with every uh, this uh, neighbor, be it Pakistan. And condition is there, India must adopt a smart diplomacy. And that's somewhere missing. It's a kind of hegemonic kind of 
uh, this neighborhood policy with uh, Hindu Twa under tombs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manto. Okay. Uh, we have a question for Shweta, and it is it has come from Dr. Pramod Jaiswal. Uh, the question is: It has been three years. Nepal and China signed BRI. What are the achievements of China in terms of BRI projects in the last three years? This question is for Shweta. However, uh, all the questions that I ask, if anyone, any of the speaker wants to add to the comments, you please feel free to do that. Thank you. Uh, there was, I think, uh, as long as I can uh, recall, there were seven major projects uh, listed on in BRI. Uh, however, uh, the, the activities and the initiatives planned on the BIO, BRI has not really taken up uh, the pace as it should. Um, however, there was some uh, progress being made in terms of some um, uh, road construction link between Nepal and China and uh, some other um, some other technical grants uh, in terms of opening uh, the cultural relations and all. Uh, however, um, I currently I'm not very, uh, very much updated uh, on those areas, but um, so in, in newspapers and other uh, articles, sometimes we see how um, Nepal and China, they, Nepal, from, from Nepal's side, we've not been able to uh, put our focus on uh, pacing up with, the, with, uh, with these agreements and getting the projects done at the um, ground level. Uh, yeah, so uh, yes, yeah, so that, that, that was one other thing uh, that I have highlighted in my presentation, where, uh, uh, where although soft power is, uh, is one major component of the BRI, but, hard, uh, but the hard projects will always remain uh, regarding those infrastructure projects. And if they won't be able to uh, implement in full scale, it's going to definitely affect the, um, China's uh, ability to expand its soft power in Nepal. So uh, my, my area of study was uh, focused on the soft power aspects of BRI. So um, I'm not very uh, well uh, updated on the hard projects uh, under BRI. But uh, what I can say is uh, it has not taken up the pace as it should. And from time and again, we, we hear news uh, in various news portals that how, uh, how Nepal is slacking in its uh, homework to pace up these projects. Does anyone want Thank to you. join, uh, add any comments to this question regarding China and BRI and Nepal? Anyone from the speakers? This is a question for Nabeen. UN was formed by the powerful nations. Do you think they will allow restructuring, losing their privileges? This is a question for Nabeen. Okay, thank you for the questions. Yeah, it is correct because you know the after the Second World War, the victorious country, the Big Five, you know they were given the special rights of veto. Why? Because to bring them together. Otherwise, they can sustain on themselves because they have huge military power, economic power. So they didn't, uh, feel, uh, without guaranteeing veto right to them, they didn't come. That's why at that time, we, let's say, the, the international community uh, gave them a special privilege so that they came together and uh, the consensus was built and uh, so, to, uh, so as to maintain the, uh, make the better international order. That was done. But it was mistake. It was mistake in the sense that, you know, the basic objectives of the UNO is to form uh, uh, to form the international co cooperations uh, and uh, how it can uh, uh, how it can stand on the realist ground because they were given and they used their veto power for their vested national interest and as far as the question is concerned you know it isn't possible you know we think that we have to restructure and reform the UN we say very easily but in fact the main cause is that the provision of veto power and the big countries the powerful countries they cannot uh, they are they are not agreed to uh, they don't agree to uh, uh, let's say ignore their veto power, they can use it for their, uh, uh, let's say, uh, state benefits. That's why restructuring and reformation of UN is not going to be as easy as we think. And uh, if we add new members, they are giving, granting them veto power again, then the situation will turn to be more problematic, I think so. Thank you, Nabeen. Uh, Manisha, for Manisha, we have a question. 
Uh, wonderful. Okay, that's a pre appreciation in the beginning. So wonderful presentation. Uh, but the question is, who will fund the trilateral management system? Nepal and Bangladesh might not be able to fund them. So will India agree to play a proactive role for the construction of such management? This question is for uh, Manisha. Do we have Manisha with us or has she left the floor? She is there, she needs to unmute herself, but... Manisha, can you unmute yourself? In the meantime, I can ask the next question. For Babita, we have a question. Uh, these days, most of the youth spend a lot of time on social media while they are being disconnected from society. How do you think it is going to impact the society in the long run? Don't you think society will be more socially disconnected and virtually connected? This is for Babita. Yes, of course. Uh, this is the um, very uh, severe problem uh, for the family members and society. Um, in terms of the uh, youth engagement uh, in social media, uh, of course, it should be think by international developers. Um, yes, it has so many positive uh, facilities and that is very easy for all of us. But um, these apps, these um, social media um, making irritated, um, making problem to the uh, mostly to the family members we are facing. We are seeing the problems in every um, family members by the by their children um, who is not, who are not um, um, listening the uh, voice of their family. Um, I mean, parents, um, that is the huge problem. Uh, in the family, obviously, if the family members, if the family uh, family are not going on uh, right track, obviously that will be impact in the society. So uh, it should be um, addressed very soon uh, uh, by uh, through the government or through the. Um, actually, it is. Um, it is being very popular. Nothing, uh, no, no one is uh, thinking on on the uh, its positive impact and negative impact. Um, so we have so many examples, so many um, uh, incidents we are seeing in the family members. So obviously we should. Uh, think we should uh, raise this type of issues um, to stop or to minimize, to mitigate such type of problems raising um, very um, fastly in the society. Thank you. Thank you, Babita. Thank you, Babita. I would just like to add uh, to your answer, and I also have a very small question for you. That we, uh, the nuisances of social media is not limited to Nepal. It is, in fact, it has become a global problem, and it is also not a problem within the family, but at a societal level, and also a political. It can it can give rise to political problems due to the propagation of propaganda of false news and false uh, propaganda on, on religious uh, comments and hate comments. So as we realize the problems that are already present, uh, could you give a few pointers on what could be the possible um, ways in which these, these problems can be controlled or mitigated? It's, it might not be, have to be uh, at an absolute term, but I would just like to know your idea, uh, some of the points that 
you know, the government of a particular country might think about to control this situation? Uh, thank you for raising these questions. Yeah, obviously it is the, uh, it is very, uh, it is not easy uh, to tackle this type of problem because it is uh, uh, totally uh, gone through the unseen uh, behavior, unseen uh, activities. So people, um, people always have misunderstand about the right news and wrong uh, wrong news. Uh, we are also we are also facing so many problems. Uh, uh, like me, I'm using um, Facebook, mostly Facebook, and uh, I used uh, so many organizations. I, I'm following so many organizations and uh, um, the new channels, news uh, newspapers, e newspapers. And I will be, uh, I, I'm being confused sometimes. Some newspapers and some, um, some newspapers are giving one news on the one aspect and another one is, another view is another. So I will be confused. I am being confused uh, seeing both news um, at the same time. So it will be difficult for the government uh, to mitigate this type of uh, problem. However, uh, it is uh, it is the liability of the um, theirs, so they should think uh, um, uh, deeply. I think they don't have um, the, they 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 are they are not uh, taking these issues um, see, uh, uh, seriously these days in Nepal. Yes, uh, as you said, this is not the issues of only of Nepal. It is a global problem. Yeah global problem everyone every people are facing from this problem people are going on the death suicide case societal case is increasing depression is in uh, depression case is very in, uh, increasing so this issue is not only for us but uh, i'm uh, I, I was focused only um, because i'm seeing the behavior of the people, behavior of the family members um, in Nepal. So I focused I, uh, on the Nepali context, but really you are, you're, you are right. Uh, this is the global problem, global issues. So uh, every um, country's government has to be aware on this um, platform. Thank you so much. Thank you, Babita. And although I completely agree that it is all, it is the liability of the government, but also charity begins at home. So we should also uh, open our minds as, um, as an educated person or those who have the ability to understand and uh, perceive what is right and wrong. So we must also start understanding from the uh, personal point of view. Now, we have yeah. a, a question for Rijal, Shiv, Kamar, uh, Shiv Ram Rijal. It's a comparative question where uh, the uh, discussion, uh, the observant has asked that, how do you look at India-Nepal relations under the Modi government and the Manmohan Singh government? It's an, it's an evaluative, uh, some, the person wants an evaluative uh, view. Okay. Did you get me? Thank you. Uh, yes, you are audible. Thank Please. you. Thank you. A uh, very pertinent for the very pertinent and uh, interesting topic. Yeah, is uh, dealing this in terms of the comparative uh, lenses. Yeah, we do we do see some sort of this in the context when Narendra Modi came to power in 2014. Right, right before that, in two 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 ten years, two ten years or one more thing, it has been almost neglected in political front, especially from the leadership, that most of the cases, India's approach to Nepal has been handled by some bureaucratic uh, uh, institutions. The changes has been seen some for some certain period of time that Narendra Modi gave, Narendra Modi, the Indian PM Narendra Modi gave some different look at his initial days. That was highly anticipated, highly appreciated. That means 
Nepal, Nepal wanted Nepal at, at that moment means in uh, 2014. Nepal, Nepal has been neglected as earlier as mentioned earlier that uh, Indian from Indian uh, uh, leadership level Nepal has has been uh, neglected or not not a single visit has taken place for 17 years. Narendra Modi did that. He gave a speech to Nepal means gave a new look, new aspiration or some sort of some new projection was was seen and even permission of uh, permission of epj so, sorting out all the outstanding problems and to deal those those aspirations were highly appreciated but again again that the some sort of bureaucratic influences influences overcome that political leadership's uh, influence towards nepal that that there lies contradiction so if we plainly see if we plainly see uh, what happened throughout the period of uh, Manmohan, uh, Manmohan Singh and what happened with the with uh, Narendra Modi's government is still there are differences in terms of time time being one one part second part uh, there, there has been some changes at least some ups and though there are there are lots of ups and downs during this this period of time but some positive signs have been seen still there is no such much chronic and not such a deadly things had happened in India and Nepal relation. Still, it can be it can be checked back to the normal situation. So there are, uh, if we plainly, if we compare in a surface level, still there are so many positives. But uh, uh, if we come to the level of uh, impact or the result, result, there are some some uh, some prospect of some prospect of uh, some pessimism pessimism in uh, Nepal, India, particularly from Nepalese side. So, uh, so what I believe is that in my presentation earlier as well, what I was talking about is that India needs to realign or let's say uh, re, re uh, calibrate its approach towards Nepal. It's basically to continue the long historical ties between India and Nepal. It is very obvious. It is very crucial and universally accepted accepted fact that Nepal India share so many uniqueness that is that that is appreciative that is accepted but but whenever we talk about uh, the in the two bilateral countries the relations between two countries the theories of international relations does not permit permit only from the eyes of historicity and uniqueness it needs a contextual upgradation that thing is essential at this moment of time that upgradation, if if we uh, if we uh, if I have to cite the EPJ member from India, uh, Professor uh, Mahindra P. Lama, he has he has clearly mentioned in his interview that that once we unveil unveil EPJ report, lots of things could uh, could get into track, or we can we can sort out the problems and we can solve the lots of problems. So. Uh, so the, the point here is that some reorientation is essential. And You're right. It is, mostly, it is mostly expected from Indian side and also from Nepalese side as well, because uh, handling with diplomatic dealing in a very balanced way is essential from both uh, both parties or both countries. Thank you. If I made it clear, thank you. Thank you. Wonderfully explained. Very comprehensively explained. I'll just quickly ask Manisha the question. I think she had missed it. Manisha, do we have us with you? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so the question for you was, who will fund the trilateral management system? Because Nepal and Bangladesh might not able to fund them. So will India agree to play a proactive role for the construction of such management? Uh, it's a wonderful question. Uh, Firstly, yes, perhaps India being in a better is in a better position to take a proactive role. However, I do believe that this is the thing that affect, is affecting all three nations, and to have one nation dominate the understanding or system would uh, be counterproductive. All three can, in some way, contribute. Secondly, if 
the nations themselves are not able to contribute or uh, lead the lead the understanding they can take the assistance of many other uh, third party for you uh, for instance europe has a wonderful flood management system we can take their expertise or uh, assistance in uh, formatting our own uh done okay. yes uh, i will just ask one last question uh, and this is uh, addressed to everyone um especially uh, dr manto manisha can uh, also okay. answer this question and uh, uh, shivaram can also question because uh, the question revolves around india india and india nepal's perception like how much is india willing to accommodate its partnership with nepal at a time when china is also increasing uh, its political and economic clout in the region it's it's very relevant to the south asian yes. context so i would like to uh, ask whoever wants to answer this question can go ahead so is it to me yes, Yeah, go ahead. No problem. Okay, okay. Thank you. It's very, very, very important. I want okay, very quick uh, comments on so this. So, for for this for for a very simple uh, dealing to this question, uh, it's 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 for sure and asserted that China's influence has rise uh, in part in particular country base as well as in the region. So, so it means that. Uh, there is no zero sum uh, there is no some alternative one is to uh, the next on this uh, particular case so that some sort of bilateral uh, bilateral can be maintained bilateral uh, aspiration can be solved so that no such differences differences has been created with india in its neighbor so that india india has some sort of pluses in relation with china another again what i i i would like to uh, remark on from nepalese perspective is that since nepal has transition has passed the transition phase and has been in political instability india needs to revise its uh, approach towards ne nepal only and only ne our stable and capable nepal can help india's interest that is related to security interest india's security interest in nepal until and unless if nepal has is neglected if nepal has been neglected or for a long time from indian side obviously that that does not matter much to china or any any power in the region but that matters back to nepal that matters back to india so india needs to recalibrate its approach to nepal particularly uh, respecting nepalese nepal's uh, aspiration of some, some, some sort of uh, sovereign equality dealing with sovereign equality thank you anyone wants to add to this uh, comment uh, yes so i believe that uh, the past few weeks particularly in, we can see india has been distracted by you know they are concentrating more on strengthening their relations with nations such as uh, japan south korea or us uh, the quad uh, particularly the quad cooperation so however they should also remember that uh, we need to keep our traditional allies with us and uh, the recent um, you know making up between india and nepal when uh, president prime minister of nepal called uh, modi to congratulate him on the independence day can be seen as the path towards you know reestablishing our previous relationship and very crucial as you said you uh, in the background uh, in amid uh, the ongoing chinese uh, india standoff anyone else who would want to Okay uh, in my opinion uh, hello in yes. hey, asma ek yo khana sana khaera ma yeso herera padaichu hai ha sa thank you hello yes please go who is speaking nabin yes, it's me not nabin is speaking yeah okay please i'll give you 30 seconds quickly to add a few okay. points but in my opinion nepal lies between china and india and uh, it has a uh, yeah. yeah. uh, yeah. foreign foreign policy is that uh, it's foreign policy that it will maintain equidistance and non aligned uh, foreign policy so i think uh,
China's uh, influence in Nepal is not going to harm to India because Nepal is able to maintain balanced relationship from east to present. That's why it is not a serious case, and uh, India should not be let's say uh, have much worry uh, worry about it because an independent country can maintain equidistant relationship uh, the way it likes. That is my opinion. Okay, then uh, I think we have covered almost everyone. I'll end the uh, session by uh, quickly thanking all of you. All of your panelists have been wonderful, very, very, uh, you have added some very good points, very important points that are pertinent to the current world affair, how it is going. And uh, besides studying only India, China, and US and how uh, the world order is going to change or how the global power is going to change. It is also important to um, touch upon United Nations, social media, because although they might be, they might not be in the discussion, uh, in the forefront of the discussion, but they are also equally adding up to the society and they are also equally adding up to the political scenarios of, of the globe. So with that, I would like to thank each one of you for presenting so wonderfully. I think we are almost at the end of our session. And uh, I again thank NICE for this wonderful session, this opportunity. Uh, thank you all. I'll uh, hand it over to Gayatri for now. Distinguished chair, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the session. It is my honor to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE, to all who have graced us with your presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. First of all, we would like to express our profound gratitude and sincere thanks to Dr. Nimonti Barua for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all our speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such a comprehensive and convincing presentation. We are really honored to have you here. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must mention a deep sense of appreciation for our audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching this live on our YouTube channel. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making the session productive with your questions. We're Thank truly you. honored to have you all with us this evening and hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.